Great. I hate to interrupt these ongoing conversations. It's so wonderful to see all of you in this room in person. <laughs> this is uh, the most elaborate event we've had at ISR since I joined this community. So I'm so happy to see all of you. Hi, I'm Kate Cagney, Director of the Institute for Social Research, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Robert F. Shandy Symposium. As I said, I'm so happy to see you both in the room and those participating on Zoom. And so I'm gonna start with a few housekeeping matters. For those of you who are joining us via Zoom, we're providing live captioning of this event. And you can view those captions by turning on the closed captioning feature on your screen. For those of you joining us in person today, you'll find important places such as restrooms through the door on my left from the atrium, they're down the first hall on your right. If you need anything at all, I'm happy to help you. I'm also offering Tara Engholm, Anna Massey. Tara and Anna, are you in the room? Soon they, you'll see them. I think you've already met them. Should you need anything at all, please reach out to one of us. And I also want to know too, so many of you have already shared your memories and photos of Bob. We saw those like rolling through today. Um, and we thank you. If anyone has any memories they would like to share for the memory book, please email them to isrcommunications at umich.edu or write them on the cards that are provided on the table with the name tags. The structure of the time we will share together today is a reflection of the man. Those presenting their scholarly work, chairing sessions, and commenting are those whom Bob mentored. In order to honor Bob, we had to create a day that he would be comfortable with. And we believed he would approve an event in his name that facilitated the well-being of others. And I hope you'll note uh, in your packet uh, the really great agenda and schedule has a list of all the mentees in the back. On that note, I'm going to spend a moment talking about that very phenomenon. While Bob's discipline of economics would emphasize his human capital characteristics, which were considerable, I want to take a moment to draw out concepts rooted in the discipline of sociology. That is the social capital Bob generated and maintained. You could say that Bob did not write on social capital. I know that's true. But the social capital he created led in large part to the scholarship you will learn about today. There are many working definitions of social capital. Many in the room have contributed to that scholarship. It arises from the human capacity to consider others and to work cooperatively toward common goals. It's an emerging property. It's indivisible. It exists only when we are here in the room together relates to social networks, social relationships and social structures, it involves knowing each other and having pro-social relationships based on trust and reciprocity. And I also wanted to share, I saw that come to life, oh, 25 or so years ago, <laughs> just kind of estimate the rest. I first met Bob through the National Institute on Aging Grand Summer Institute. I was a pre-doc and the Rand Summer Institute was designed to bring in early career scholars who were interested in research on the demography and economics of aging. Everyone wanted to be around Bob. He was so warm and welcoming to all his students. And as I interacted throughout the course of the weekend, I also noticed some things that made Bob stand out. Um, and I should set the stage a little bit. This is a room embedded with economists. Um, and you probably know where I'm going with this story, but now I'm going to say it anyway. What might distinguish Bob, you ask? And he was just, he was such a nice economist. And I, 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 I've met nice ones. There are nice ones in the room. I think we should acknowledge that. But at the moment, right, he did stand out. He was an economist who raised his hand. And an economist who not only raised his hand, but he waited to be called on. And I'm not using that as a hint for today's right method, but, but it was something to behold. I also learned at that time that he was collaborating with academics across disciplines. He had an openness to other ways of seeing that I had witnessed a few scholars in that time, and it was really inspiring. I left that weekend feeling like I had found my place, my community, and that is in large part due to Bob and the connectedness he created. One can fully appreciate why Bob was so central to the ISR community and why he was so effective in helping the careers of others launch and flourish. And on connectedness, the committee who planned this day, already close friends and connected, I hope became more so through this event. Thank you to Chair Mary Beth Ostadal and her committee, Vicki Friedman and Linda Martin for making all of this come together. Their easy and effortless style and grace is evident in the shape of our event. I also wanna thank all of those who worked to make this symposium a reality. 
ISR staff, Anna Massey, managed logistics. Chris and Nat created the programs and compiled the photos. Catherine Pearson, Stephanie Arnold, and Tara Engholm provided support throughout the planning period. And special thanks to Gretzen Spites, our daughters, Maggie and Sophie, Bob's siblings, Roger, Gail, and Sharon, close friends, Susan, Dave, and Kristen, who are here today. I note that Gretchen provided guidance as we framed the event. Social capital is, of course, what we are creating and contributing today in this room. I think Bob would like it that we are doing so in his name. Now let me turn to Matthew Shapiro, Director of the Survey Research Center. Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> Thanks to the organizers uh, for bringing us together today to remember uh, Bob Shaney. Uh, and thank you for all of us. For, for all of you who are joining us in Ann Arbor, this is great to get back together. And a, 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 this this will be, I think, a memorable occasion in so many ways, including uh, including the dynamic of estab establishing the in-person social capital that makes this place so so special. So I have the welcome task of uh, trying to summarize Bob's contribution to ISR, particularly through his mentorship of PhD and postdocs. Paging through the lists, we're seeing the, seeing the great pictures uh, that, that were displayed. One is struck by how long it was. Uh, everyone wanted to be work with Bob, uh, and that goes with co-authors uh, co and, and students alike. It's wonderful seeing so many of you back in Ann Arbor, present on Zoom, and with Bob in their thoughts as they spread around the world. So how to, how to summarize this body of work and scientific impact of such a large, diverse, and distinguished set of PhD and postdoctoral uh, mentees. Uh, I could enumerate their wide and high impact contributions to social science. One can and I will point to their leadership roles in institutions of higher learning and, and public policy. Uh, though I think Bob would ex be extremely gratified by their accomplishments, being proud, if, except of his children, was not his style. But on reflection, I think it's actually uh, uh, easier to summarize the essence of Bob's mentees. If one wanted to explain what the unique alchemy that makes ISR such a special place to, to learn, to thrive, and advance careers, one goes no further than the list of Bob's mentees. Indeed, I would hold up Bob's mentees as a mirror to us. We look, we look at it and see reflected in that the values of ISR and what we are inspired to advance with the same commitment that, that Bob had. So first, Bob was an economist, as is already mentioned, uh, deeply steeped in the tradition of uh, Michigan empirical research. Uh, yet, you would not infer that from the list of Bob's uh, uh, fields of his mentees. Economics is the modal field, but sociology, demography, survey research, public policy are also heavily represented. And then with, within economics, one sees fields of labor economics, public finance, macroeconomics also represented. So if one wants to understand what we mean by interdisciplinarity, just look around us, look at Bob's mentees. Second, ISR is composed of five centers with very distinct missions across the empirical social sciences. Bob was a valued citizen of two of them, the Population Study Center and the Survey Research Center. Both are stronger owing both to his considerable and quite different leadership contributions, whether it was administrative or leader of a data collection prop, uh, program. Uh, uh, Bob's, Bob's, Bob's list of mentees tells this story. You couldn't infer whether he was from PSC or SRC because it's roughly 50-50. Roughly roughly Third, uh, ISR's twin role in building methodological capacity and data infrastructure is reflected by where Bob's mentees are now. About half are in academic positions around the world of, uh, in, in a, a wide variety of departments and schools. And about half are in key government or uh, private nonprofit institutions devoted to advancing public policies. Many of Bob's students have leadership roles in these, reflecting the attention to institution building along with scientific success that made Bob such an important contributor to ISR. And fourth, the work of Bob's mentees reflects the commitment to social justice, part of the legacy of the founders of ISR and, and one that exemplified Bob's work and Bob's spirit. Many of Bob's mentees work on infrastructure of understanding the social and economic inequalities that we face, for building policies to address them, 
and for evaluating the success of, the success of these policies. Why did Bob train so many scholars who built careers addressing social justice? To ask a question that is asked every day at ICER, is Bob's mentee's concern for social adjustment, selection, or a treatment effect? <laughs> As we know, it's hard to separate them based on observational data alone. But I have a model of Bob uh, that says, of course, it's both. Students came to Bob because he, he, he worked on things that mattered. They left with him equipped with tools to make a difference. I also have auxiliary information, which helps in identifying a model. <laughs> Fellow faculty members do not directly observe the mentee ment mentor relationship, which usually takes place hunched over computers, working on chalkboards or whiteboards, or uh, passing, uh, passing on comments on drafts. So it's very private. Uh, but I did get to observe Bob as a coach. Whereas girls Burns Parks teams routinely trounced my daughter's angel schools. <laughs> so my model of, of Bob as mentor is inextricably linked to images of Bob, both vigorously inspired and gently instructing a scrum of little leaders. Everyone wanted to be on Bob's team. Thanks everybody for your patience. So my name is Sarah Burgard. I'm the director of the Population Studies Center. So the other of the two centers that um, Matthew first introduced that Bob was such a central part of and such a um, shining example of. And I've been asked to speak about Bob's genuinely special talent for mentoring postdoctoral scholars. I was privileged to co-lead the Population Studies Center's postdoc program with Bob for a number of years. And so I had a front row seat to see his true talents in this area. And so I'd like to give you a little bit of background. A couple of decades ago, postdoctoral positions were not very common in the social sciences. They're much more common in the biological and lab-based sciences and had a very different model. Um, and over the course of both of our careers, they've become more available and more attractive for junior scholars. And many people in the room were uh, part of, of one of these programs that, that Bob was involved with for postdoctoral scholars. So they're professionally becoming much more powerful, um, an opportunity for folks to publish more, to make different connections, but they, they nonetheless remain as sort of a liminal space, right? You're no longer a graduate student. Um, so you're taking on a new identity but you also aren't yet a fully fledged researcher or professor or whatever grown up job it is that you're trying to get to. You probably just moved across the country to a position that will last only a couple of years and then <laughs> have to be off on your way again, right? And so uh, it's not the same thing as being a PhD student where you have many years to get embedded in networks and find your people and get your resources set up. So it can be a confusing and alienating time to be sure for many people. And I believe that Bob has had a very big impact personally on what has made postdocing a valuable and productive experience for social scientists of our generation and, and will continue to be. In our one-on-one -on -one meetings with each other and each of the center's postdocs that we counseled over the years, we talked carefully through their plans, the specific gaps in their training or things in their CV that they were hoping to fill in what is really a very short time uh, in a postdoctoral position. He was immediately present with connections, resources, advice, uh, just good humor about the difficulties of the position. Um, but it never was this parental or um, in any way uh, a, a person teaching someone. It was really collegial. Bob was the consummate coach. And I really reflected on, on what Matthew was just saying. Um, and a colleague at the same time. And that's actually a pretty rare combination in this business where the pressure to self-promote and colonize other people's projects and have your name first on everything is actually quite strong and, and grosses a lot of us out, to be honest. Um, and I learned a lot from Bob about how to give incredible, wide-ranging, holistic to support to someone and also to be straight with them about risks or challenges that they might face if they're gonna um, go toward a certain endeavor or direction with their work without taking away any of their independence or their enthusiasm for the work they were doing. And that's a really unique, incredible talent. On the rare occasions when we needed to advise a postdoc on a touchy interpersonal situation or a professional challenge, Bob beautifully reinforced my disciplinary training in sociology again, um, 
And he really taught us that it's often the person with the least power in the relationship that has the clearest view of what's going on. And I think Bob really taught us, um, I learned some, some incredible advocacy and diplomacy from Bob. He was a real natural at this. And he, I marvel at it still because it's not easy to carve out that genuine care for another person's situation in the stress of all the other career obligations that he had and continued to have and that were kind of more immediately pressing on him, all those little fires you have to put out every day, he was able to just set that aside and focus the true, you know, genuine rays of his attention on folks. And that was something to admire and for me to try to live up to. I really liked that Bob knew his priorities and he didn't get swept up in small-minded dramas, right? Which um, can plague <laughs> our jobs and our day. So I was recently honored to be made director of the Population Studies Center. And this is a position that Bob should have rightly had and would have flourished in and our center would have been incredibly strengthened by it. So I can honestly say that it's been my honor when working with our incredible staff, our postdocs, our graduate students, our junior faculty, and all of my colleagues to routinely ask myself when making decisions, as corny as it sounds, what would Bob do in this situation? And I'm so delighted to be among a room full of people who probably do the same thing in many situations. So thank you very much. I'm gonna hand it back to Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Joining us today is Gretchen Spritzer, Bob's wife. She is the Associate Dean for Engaged Learning and Professional Development of the Ross School of Business and the Keith E. and Valerie J. Lessie Professor of Business Administration. Gretchen's research focuses on employee empowerment and leadership development, particularly within a context of organizational change and decline. Today, Gretchen will speak about Bob and their family. Welcome, Gretchen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So loud as we can. Should I move it up? All right. How about that? Can you hear me okay? okay? All right. Well, wow. It's wonderful to be here with all you, all of you today. It's such a special um, uh, opportunity to honor Bob. He would have been completely uncomfortable with all of this, <laughs> of course, but I do know he's, he's with us here today in spirit with uh, his sparkly eyes shining down and a tear, sharing all these wonderful compliments about him. Um, the pictures earlier were just amazing. Um, I uh, Some of them I had never seen before and all of those pictures of the run for Bob, uh, it's just like so many years. I have to tell you recently, um, a friend from church offered to make a quilt of some of the t-shirts. And so I compiled them all. I think I'm missing 2012 or something, but I have all of the other ones and it's truly amazing that all those years people came out to support Bob and that we just love that. Um, so planning this special half day symposium on Bob's honor alongside the trends meeting was I think just a brilliant idea because Bob so loved that group. Um, I was reflecting, where is Linda? Um, there's Linda. Linda would always come a day or so early and come over and we catch up and she'd come and see a soccer game or a field hockey game or, or something. But it reminded me how he looked forward to those kind of gatherings of people that were not only colleagues, but that he considered um, close friends and almost family. Um, Bob often used the phrase seize the day or carpe diem. I don't know if you ever heard that, but he used it a lot at home with me and with the girls. Um, and even before he was diagnosed with ALS, a big part of his life was living a life that mattered. And I think um, you use those terms. Um, to Matthew. Um, Bob really wanted to live a life that mattered. And I was struck by some of the examples that all three of you shared uh, about that in his professional life. I didn't always see that side of him, um, uh, but I, I uh, can definitely see it in other aspects of our life. So how did he, how did he do that? How did he live a life that mattered? 
Well, one is he loved working with young people, whether it was on the soccer field or the field hockey field. I, I think he coached six or seven different sports of our daughters. And it part, partly was a chance to be with our daughters, but more importantly, also, he really loved being with young people and seeing them develop. And then he loved being with the doctoral students here, the postdocs. Um, Sarah, I'm just looking at right now, had us over to see her garden plot. You know, Bob's wheeling his wheelchair, getting stuck in you know, ruts, but he didn't care. He wanted to be there to, uh, to see and be with, be with Sarah. Um, and I have to tell you, when I looked at the program for today, I, was, I recognized some of the names of the people that he mentored, but there were so many more um, than that. I know he was in Princeton early, um, as uh, Sarah was saying, in his second year, he started working at the Population Studies Center. He had a, a, a what was it called, a training grant? What was that, is that what it was gonna call? Um, and worked under David, and I think though he got imprinted with that importance of interdisciplinary work, they were over in University Towers, above what, at one time there was an Orange Julius there. <laughs> um, and he shared an office with Tim Waitman, and I, I think I see Tom Maloney on the Zoom too. And they just had wonderful times, you know, uh, goofing off, but also <laughs> supporting each other um, in their work. But um, I think it, it imprinted him the importance of studying topics that, that mattered. Um, from his doctoral days to his early days at the Rand Corporation, working with people like Linda, um, studying intergenerational transfers and health. He studied homelessness because at that time it was a big problem in Santa Monica, uh, California. He loved the opportunity and to have a chance to apply some of his um, ideas and research kind of coming back to what Yuffie was saying, trying to make a difference in the world during his time on President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, where he did a lot of work on their Welfare to Work program, which had mixed success, but it was really exciting to think about what could be possible um, there. And then in his more recent work around um, aging and disability, and most recently around dementia. Um, so that was, that was one. He loved working with um, young people, too. He loved working on research projects that mattered. And then three, again, I'm repeating some of the things you've heard before, but he loved working with people who were different than him so that he could learn from them and grow as well. He loved being in interdisciplinary groups. He loved at that at the Population Studies Center, working with demographers and sociologists and political scientists. He loved that in his time at RAND. And it was why the ISR was such a great home for him um, when he came back uh, to Michigan. Um, again, looking at the program, it was remarkable how many people collaborated with my colleague Andy Hoffman said, who's this Homer Scrancher guy? You can collaborate with my dad. <laughs> 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 father and he said, well, what about you? Why didn't you guys have a <laughs> <laughs> um, And I have to say, I'm so grateful to ISR, even when Bob went on disability. A lot of times, or most of the time, they take away your email, they take away your computer, you are strictly a disability. That would have been many of the because he loved to work, continuing to work um, with people. And so be able, being able to keep his email, being able to keep his computer so that continuous collaborations was so important and giving him a reason, a purpose, a uh, 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 um, part of his role to keep living, even as things got more and more difficult um, for him. Um, it even came to a point where um, the, the week that he passed away, I think even on the day that he passed away, there was a publication that was accepted, I think for Vicki. She's online. Online. Okay, with Vicki, I believe. Um, I, I, so I, those are the three big things that stand out to me. His love of working with younger, more junior people on research on topics that mattered, and I'm working with people who were um, different than him, so that he could learn and grow as a result. I also think it's very ironic that a guy who, over time, had no voice left, could collaborate with so many different people. I think he taught us to be present, to slow down, and to really listen, because there were all those moments of pauses where we were waiting for him to speak. So along with Bob's family, who are here today, Rodrick and his brother, um, Sharon and Gail, his sisters, our friends, Dave, um, Susan, and Kristen, 
um, our uh, my mom, who I believe is on the, on the Zoom, my mom, um, and our two daughters, uh, Maddie and Sophie. Maddie is teaching second grade. She's in the classroom right now. She has no vacation days left until uh, June 27th, which she finished as her first year of very challenging teaching. Um, and Sophie, who's in the middle of final exams right now, getting ready to graduate. Um, um, who are with us in spirit and are looking forward to watching this afterward. I think Sophie's going to peek on at some point when she's in between things today. Um, but we'd all like to thank the organizers, Kate and Meredith, um, and all of the other folks who I've met today who have done an amazing job of pulling all of this um, together. We're so um, grateful and inspired, and um, we're so also happy to see all of the folks on Zoom. I also wanted to thank the chairs and the co-chairs of the leadership committee and all the people who contributed to the Robert F. Shady Research Professorship, especially Jim and Wendy, who had the hard job of trying to convince Bob this would actually be a good job. A good idea. <laughs> Even though there's so many other people at ISR who are so um, deserving as well. Um, but he was deeply touched and honored by it. And I know I and our family and friends are comforted that his legacy is going to continue into the future here at Iowa. So thank you for being here today. For putting all of this on, it's, it's very meaningful, and I'm going to try to keep it together. So <laughs>